Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Energy City Plugged In Podcast, where we talk about the latest in news, sports, culture, and the energy sector in the Estevan area. The Energy City Plugged In Podcast is sponsored by Estevan Mercury Publications. And joining me today for our monthly look at the oil and gas sector is Brian Zinchuk, the editor for Pipeline News, Saskatchewan's monthly petroleum newspaper. Brian, as always, it's great to have you join us. Good afternoon. I think the uh, the big story that we've had in the last month or so since you last joined us in the energy sector is the sale of uh, Sonovus Energy's uh, Southeast Saskatchewan uh, assets to Whitecap Resources. Right, yeah, that's commonly known as the Weyburn Unit. The Weyburn Unit, okay. And uh, Sonovus was the operating partner. They had 62.1%, I believe. So they had the the vast majority of that. They weren't the only partner, though. There's about two dozen companies that have uh, ownership in the the unit. Uh, the sale was for nine hundred and forty million dollars, which is a good chunk of change. Absolutely, it's more than I'll ever make. And one of the things that's unique here is that uh, the Sonovus unit is about sixty three years old, and ever since its inception the operating company has never really changed. As far as I know, it has been always an evolution from one company to the next company, whereas Pan Canadian became in Canada, which became uh, Sonovus. This is a total change in the operatorship, which is, uh, I mean, you see that everywhere else, mm-hmm. except in the Weber unit. It just mm-hmm. never happened. People could, you know, generations could work in the Weber unit and uh, have no change. But this was something that was... Sonovus was looking for somebody to purchase the Weyburn unit, correct? Yeah. They had to sell off a whole schwack of assets, and that's a technical term, their schwack, because uh, they bought out ConocoPhillips, their partner, in their oil sands assets. Now, they need to come up with many billion dollars right now, and they figured they'd do a swing loan, and, well, they weren't. the market wasn't as kind to the purchase as they had thought, so they, you know, they had to sell these things pretty quick. And uh, th- this was one of a number of sales that went through. Okay, so what does this mean for the Estevan area? Well, uh, the big thing is is that uh, in the past few years of the downturn, Sonovus had really turned down the amount of money they were spending there. They were, you know, extracting oil as usual, but they had stopped drilling. Uh, in fact, they'd hardly drilled anything since the downturn hit. Now, I had attended a safety meeting for Sonovus a few years ago where uh, Precision Drilling Rig 275 got, a, I think it was either a 20- or 25-year safety award because they've been drilling consistently for decades in the same place. Well, that rig is now racked in uh, Stoughton last time I saw. What this means, and I got here, uh, Whitecap is talking about doing 189 wells. I didn't say the timeline, but that's a lot more than zero. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, new wellheads, that means new uh, pipelines to connect them, that means a whole bunch of additional work. So that is a really big boost to the region. What uh, what kind of presence did Whitecap Resources have in the southeast before this uh, purchase happened? I don't know if Whitecap had much of anything in this region. Now, Whitecap is... But they obviously do now. They do now, yes. Now, Whitecap is uh, one of the up-and-comers in the Saskatchewan oil patch. They've, uh, they've grown substantially into a decent-sized intermediate. Uh, about a year and a half ago or so, they have purchased a bunch of Huskies assets that they were selling off. Uh, in fact... This purchase with the Snovus thing is very similar to the Husky thing in that you have a large oil sands player which had items all over the place and they're selling off everything that wasn't oil sands uh, or in Husky's case, heavy oil. So uh, that they picked up about oh, 11,000 uh, BOE per day in the Swift Current area, which they're developing and drilling hard. So this is a similar size purchase here and it means that uh, they're definitely one of the up-and-comers. Now, of course, Snovus was the company that had uh, that had purchased the uh, captured carbon from the uh, Boundary Dam project, the, the carbon capture and storage project at Boundary Dam, correct? It that's was the, the, that's it correct. It was the yeah. off-taker. So does this deal affect that at all? So they are going to continue for contract. and uh, Which they, I believe has seven years left. Seven years left, and then ongoing from there. But here's the thing. They plan on... Uh, in, Synovus had stopped developing new areas uh, where they would do what's called a pattern and uh, you, you start putting injectors in and then develop that area for carbon capture, then do the next few miles and do another pattern, uh, kind of like uh, cells in a honeycomb. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, White Cap plans on doing that. And most, one of the most interesting things, I actually had a discussion, which is in this paper, uh, with the CEO of uh, This White month's Cap. edition of Pipeline? That's correct, uh, Grant Fagerheim. And uh, he said that they're going to be uh, possibly using this uh, technology elsewhere, outside of Southeast Saskatchewan. They may be using it in Alberta. or He didn't say exactly where, but anywhere that's not here means that's new uh, CCS. Now, it depends on uh, where they can get carbon, obviously, carbon dioxide, but... Alberta's got that trunk line that they've built, so maybe that's what he's referring to. So this could be good news for the, more good news for the Estevan area than this, this sale that was announced last month. It would or be earlier this month. If they do that, it would be uh, one of the first uh, new implementations of CCS uh, in Western Canada since this and the Mydale unit went online about 15, uh, 17 years ago. Excellent. Well, Brian, thank you very much for the information on that. When we come back, we're going to be talking about a new play in the uh, southeast region. But first, we have a word from our sponsor, Estevan Mercury Publications. Are you playing Estevan Mercury's business bingo contest? On November 1st, we started our Christmas promotion, and it is going strong. You could win a $2,500 cash prize or weekly prize packages. Uh, playing the Estevan Mercury Publications Business Bingo promotion is easy. Cut your bingo card out of your Mercury or Southeast Lifestyles, take it shopping with you, and earn your stamps. Once you have five stamps in a row, bring your card to the Mercury office to enter the draw. You can play multiple cards and enter as often as you like. Draws are made every Wednesday at 5, so play today. Welcome back, and joining me once again is Brian Zinchuk, the editor of Pipeline News. I guess the other big story that we have seen recently, Brian, is this idea of potentially a new oil play in the in the in the works. I guess it's not a new play, but new investment uh, that we saw with the provincial land sale uh, back in October. So, what is some of the background uh, on this new play? That's right. So, back in October, we had a land sale that, uh, on first blush, didn't look like much money. It was nineteen million dollars, of which seventeen million dollars was for uh, exploratory licenses, not leases for 500 sections of land, 500 square miles. Well, later in October, during Crescent Point's uh, third quarter results, uh, their CEO, Scott Saxberg, basically said, yeah, that was us. And uh, he explained in great detail that they had purchased a large block of land and they were developing what they're calling the lodgepole play. Now, Saskatchewan geologists call it the Sewers Valley Beds, but in both uh, North Dakota, Montana, and uh, Manitoba, it's referred to as the lodgepole. So the two were kind of synonymous with the same name. Now, how big is this lodgepole play? Is it the same size as the back and play? Back and play? Well, okay. Well, the lodgepole is you know, widespread throughout, but uh, for the area that they're targeting, uh, it basically runs from Highway 35 near Tribune uh, in a west northwest direction to Highway 34 south of Bengoff. It's about six to ten miles wide for a, a wide band of that and then another stretch runs down south to the u.s border near lake alma okay so is there a, a direct impact for the estevan area from this lodgepole play well the interesting thing is that uh i spoke to a few people about this and there is essentially no infrastructure for anything in that area there quite literally is a place called the gap as mm-hmm. in the rural municipality of The Gap, because yeah. there's nothing there. Perfect name then, right? Yeah, so if uh, they told me, if you want to get a washer for a bolt, you're going to be driving an hour and a half each direction. So, I mean, there's very little in the way of gas stations, restaurants, anything. So that area is going to be serviced out of... <coughs> excuse me. That area will be serviced out of uh, both Estvan and Weyburn. Uh, it's a pretty large stretch. Uh, you know, it's going to mean a lot more traffic on Highway 18, which is total garbage and falling mm-hmm. apart, and it needs a lot of attention. But for the area here, just to give you an, an idea, the Viewfield Balkan, which was, you know, the big Balkan boom, mm-hmm. uh, is roughly 24, 25 townships, which is 36 uh, sections per township. The area they purchased here is about 13 townships, give or take. So it's roughly half the size. Now, remember back in 2008 when we had that billion-dollar land sale? That is a beautiful day. Yeah, well, here they got half the amount of land for $17 million. Okay. So uh, they may be crazy like a fox in the way they've done it uh, to uh, secure the leases for the, this land for another five years. They have to drill roughly 30, 35 wells, which... Uh, 
you know, isn't that hard for a company that often employs 20 uh, drilling rigs at a time. So is it going to be a while before we start to see some some work in the lodge pole play? Uh, I, well, I, first of all, I should... At least the Saskatchewan part of it? I don't think they would have announced it unless they're actually ready to go hard on it because mm-hmm. they've been doing some tight hole stuff for a while, and that's what they said in this uh, announcement. And they think they've pretty much got it, and now they're ready to go public with it. So now it won't be as hush-hush as it was before. I imagine it'll still be, well, some tight hole stuff. But because they've got the land locked up, no one else can jump in and grab it. Uh, one of the other things, just to, so people understand the geology of this, is that the lodge pole is the formation directly above the Bakken. Mm-hmm. So ge- ge- geologically, geologically. Above. So when, so when you're drilling down, you hit the lodge pole first, and then the Bakken, and then the Torquay slash Three Forks, which is the deepest. Yeah, and in that area, the, the Torquay is the big play. There also is some Bakken development, and here is a third one, basically what they call a stacked play. Mm-hmm. Uh, I spoke to some of the provincial geologists about this. And they don't have a lot of data because not a lot of wells have been drilled specifically for the lodge pole that are public data. But uh, for some of them, they said that there is as much as 50 meters worth of uh, oil-rich uh, deposits. Now, when you consider when you're drilling for the Bakken in the Stoughton area, you might be drilling for an area that's 2 to 3 meters thick. If you have a 50-meter thick area of, uh, of oil, and if that is consistent through a larger area— and that's huge. Mm-hmm. But the, the key thing is, and uh, this, I mean, Saxburg referenced this, is that they still haven't totally sorted it out how to get to extract it. They're still working on that. You know, we knew about the Bakken since the 50s. I was going to say, they said the Bakken was one of those. We always knew it was there. It just couldn't access it. Correct? Yeah, I just couldn't figure out a way to extract oil where yeah. it actually come out. So this is a similar a tight formation. It's going to require fracking. It's, it may require... You know, certain uh, tonnages, certain types of sand, whatever it is, uh, and they're still working on that. But once they have that figured out, it's basically will likely be uh, one of those wash, rinse, repeat things, you know, cut and paste uh, for miles at a time. So is is Lodgepole one of those that they also knew was there and they're just able to get to it now? I suspect so. Uh, One person told me that uh, a significant number of oil companies have tried to develop this play. In fact, some of this acreage had been uh, bought as exploratory licenses three times over and let go back to the government because they simply couldn't develop it. They couldn't crack that nut. So uh, Crescent Point seems to think that they have. I guess we'll see. But if it is the case, that's uh, one of the big things for the future of this region, not just for, for Weyburn or for Estevan, but everyone. Yeah. So should I be investing in real estate in Tribune right now? Uh, honestly... <laughs> I don't think uh, I don't think that many things will be established out in this area because it is effectively it's almost wilderness. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the gap. It's the gap, and the reality is is that no one's going to be setting up new towns or new homesteads and stuff there. You may see one or two shops set up there for you know a few years down the road. Uh, you know maybe someone set up a, a welding shop or something like that. But will this lead to a boom town in Ongar or? Or, or uh, Ben Goff. Ben Goff or Radville. Radville is probably the closest to the most of us. So they may see the most direct economic benefit. It could be the next Stoughton, for example. You know, if, if things go great, it might be the next Stoughton, for example. Yeah, maybe next Stoughton, but not the next Carlisle. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, you know, being so far away from both Weyburn and Estevan is that, uh, you know, drilling rig crews, instead of uh, driving home every night, they might end up having to have a camp somewhere and stay closer <laughs> to the rig. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for that uh, information, Brian. It's certainly uh, exciting to hear something like that. When we get back, we're going to talk about a couple other uh, issues in the Southeast Saskatchewan oil patch. But again, here's another word from our sponsor, Estevan Mercury Publications. Are you playing Estevan Mercury's business bingo contest? On November 1st, we started our Christmas promotion, and it is going strong. You could win a $2,500 cash prize or weekly prize packages. Uh, Playing the Estefan Mercury Publications Business Bingo promotion is easy. Cut your bingo card out of your Mercury or Southeast Lifestyles, take it shopping with you, and earn your stamps. Once you have five stamps in a row, bring your card to the Mercury office to enter the draw. You can play multiple cards and enter as often as you like. Draws are made every Wednesday at 5, so play today. Welcome back, and thanks again, Deanna, for the information on the uh, 
Christmas bingo promotion that's being offered by uh, Estevan Mercury Publications. I just want to say uh, congratulations to our winners so far. Uh, week one, it was Rosalie Story, and then week two, it was Carrie Gilroy, and our most recent winner was uh, Brenda Turnbull. So uh, congratulations to all of them. Brian, welcome back for this final segment. Uh, of course, last month, the, the big discussion in the area was the future of carbon capture and storage at the Boundary Dam power station. And it's kind of boiled down to did did the SAS power president say that they were moving away from it or did it he? And there were a lot of people in the area concerned about it. So is there anything new on this front? I think the answer is there's nothing really new on it. I had a good chat for uh, about half an hour with the CEO of SAS Power, Mike Marsh, about that. And I get the impression that CBC kind of took it a little out of context. Not that that would surprise me in the slightest. But uh, in regards to what SAS Power is planning on doing, he basically explained that, look, these are the prices right now. Uh, natural gas is a lot cheaper than we expected it was going to be because natural gas has typically fluctuated up and down, and it's been down for a lot, very long time. Uh, it is currently cheaper than carbon capture. But when it comes down to it is that SAS Power really only has two options for baseload power, carbon capture, CCS, mm -hmm. uh, or per carbon capture, coal, uh, or natural gas. And while they are adding wind, it's not good enough for baseload. Uh, it's probably not going to be good enough for base load uh, for a while. Uh, I know that in the past, have you had a chance? To, you, you've talked to the different leaders. I've talked to the different leaders about their thoughts on CCS. They're all on board with it. So should that does that remain a, an encouraging sign for the Estevan area? Well, I spoke to uh, all of the SAS party uh, candidates except for one. and That would be uh, uh, Rob Clark. Rob Clark. Uh, we had something lined up, but it fell through. So... Uh, anyhow, I spoke to all of them and they all seem to be pretty supportive. Now, this is also members of the cabinet who endorsed it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't expect anyone to say, oh, no, by the way, I endorsed it five years ago, but now I, not so much. Uh, the other thing is that I also spoke to one of the NDP, uh, leadership candidates, uh, yesterday. I'm speaking another one today and Ryan Miley is not a candidate, uh, who is going to support for the CCS. He says, we keep the one we have, but that's it. Fair enough. Uh, so I guess we're still in a holding pattern when it comes to CCS, and we probably won't know anything until early next year. That's uh, where we're at right now. I don't think we're going to hear anything else in that regard for a while. Okay. Uh, is there anything that people can look forward to seeing in this month's edition of Pipeline News uh, that's now available uh, that we may not have covered? One of the things that was really uh, enthusiastic about this month is the fact that it was a focus on Esteban. And we're actually doing that over two months. And the first month was primarily about new businesses in Estevan. Now, given the downturn, has it hardly seen any new businesses anywhere? Mm -hmm. I came across roughly a half dozen in Estevan that have popped up mostly in the last six months. Now, that's uh, good news. Be very encouraging. Because we used to have that. Our paper was filled with new businesses ev everywhere we went mm -hmm. uh, all the time. And then the downturn hit. And it's like, oh, boy, do we keep the lights on or not? So to see a half dozen businesses having the courage to go out and do this while oil is still in a funk, I mean, it's coming back, but it's, you know, it's not great guns yet. And the rates they can charge are not great guns either. Uh, you know, it's encouraging to see that. It's some of the best news I've seen for a while. Excellent. Well, Brian, thank you very much for joining us for this week's edition of the Energy City Plugged In podcast. I also want to thank... Uh, producer Will Acri for uh, his work and making us sound good. And I want to thank the Estevan Mercury Publications for continuing to sponsor this podcast. My name is David Wilberg, and I'll talk to you next time.